just off Interstate 80 and south of the transcontinental railroad town of Colfax, you will find an old stagecoach gravel road named Yankee Jim's Road. Take the adventure as you cross the 1930 Yankee Jim's Bridge, look down onto the North Fork of the American River. Drive slowly as the road narrows in places to one lane. You will eventually come to the town of Yankee Jim's. Today, Yankee Jim's is not quite a ghost town as the population today is about five. During the height of the gold rush, 5,000 individuals inhabited Yankee Jim's. In Yankee Jim's, you would have found schools, hotels, stores, churches, a post office, plus hundreds of tents inhabited by miners. Hydraulic mining would have encircled the town. Today, the old school bell has survived. While service ended in 1940, United States Post Office building still stands. In front of the old post office, a bench silently awaits stagecoach passengers. Stage to Colfax, um, climb aboard. Troy, Troy, wake up. Help Mrs. Boulders with her hat box and suitcases. Now, Mrs. Boulders, thank your husband for the sample coffee. Delicious. Now, not to worry. We'll have you in Colfax in plenty of time to catch the Central Pacific train to Sacramento. Wikipedia notes that Yankee Jim was an Australian criminal who hid his horses on the very spot gold was discovered. This would be a perfect topic to begin our story. Was Yankee Jim from Australia? Or where was he from? News of the discovery of gold in California could not be kept secret. The exciting discovery leaped from San Francisco to Hawaii and on to Sydney, Australia. Australian merchants reasoned that they could reach San Francisco faster than merchants from New York or Boston. On January 21, 1849, loaded with goods to sell, the first Australian ship, the Eleanor Lancaster, lifted anchor for San Francisco. After 71 days at sea, on April 2, 1849, she dropped anchor. Following the Eleanor Lancaster, 48 other Australian merchant ships sailed to San Francisco. Once in San Francisco with the lure of quick riches, sailors and passengers jumped ship and headed into the mother load. Some Aussies would reawaken their prior larcenous ways seeking quick riches by any other means. In the early years of the gold rush, San Francisco, as well as the mining towns of the Mother Lode, had little or no law enforcement. Mining towns only had recourse to crime was to organize vigilance committees. A quick trial meted out various penalties from whippings, brandings, cutting off hands or noses, to banishment. For major crimes, like murder, prisoners were hanged the following day. Being called a Sydneyite or Sydney duck became pejorative words. French Canadians, citizens from former Spanish territories, Native Americans, African Americans, and Asians were all held suspect. Gold, as well as land ownership, was meant for Anglo-Saxon English-speaking Americans. If not from an Australian merchant ship, one can only speculate on how else James Robinson could have arrived in the gold fields of California. He might have simply jumped ship from either a Hudson Bay Company ship or maybe a Yankee whaling ship. Besides of Australia hearing the cry of gold, Oregon Territory also heard the cry. Peter Burnett, California's first governor, explains how he and his fellow Oregonians left their homes in search of gold. White population of Oregon in 1848 was 10,000, and at least two-thirds of the white population of Bering Arms left in the summer and fall of 1848 for California. In the autumn of 1849, found John Ross in Oregon threshing his field. It was at this time word of California's gold discovery reached his farm in southern Oregon. Hearing the news, 
he immediately stopped threshing his wheat field, gathered 28 men, and headed to California. Ross and his companions reached California's Feather River. In 1878, Ross shared his experiences with California's historian, Hubert Bancroft. Ross reported that James, Yankee Jim, Robinson, in the autumn of 1849, was one of his companions on this expedition. Yankee Jim was a notorious character. Yankee Jim was a sailor, rough man, a very bad man. He was hung afterwards. He was a man of marked ability, knew Spanish and several languages perfectly. The next earliest reference of James Robinson comes from Benjamin Courier. Traveling from Newburyport, Massachusetts, Courier arrived in the Mother Lode in 1849. Searching for gold, Courier heard tales of a mysterious miner who had discovered a rich vein of gold. Published in 1882 in the book, The History of Placer County, the tale continues of what happened next. While Ross returned to Oregon, others of his party headed south, exploring the North Fork of the American River. The first authentic account the writer ever had of the strange character whose synonym is perpetuated in the name of one of the most important mining sections of Placer County was from a gentleman, now a resident of Georgetown, El Dorado County, named Benjamin C. Courier, who with the writer was mining in the fall of 1849 near Barnes Bar on the North Fork of the American River. Late in the summer of that eventful year, rumors came to Barnes Bar of rich diggings having been found in the hills somewhere up the ridge between the North and Middle Forks, and these rumors were sometimes accompanied by tangible evidence of their existence in the shape of large, oblong pieces of gold, often weighing several ounces, brought into this camp by the character known as Yankee Jim. With this laudable purpose in view, sometime during the month of November, Messrs. Courier, Smith, Steen, O'Hara, Sphinx, and other man, whose name is not remembered, fitted out and started from a place then known as Long Bar in the first bend below Barnes Bar in search of Yankee Jim and his diggings. On the seventh day, Mr. Courier sets out on his own. Mr. Courier started out alone from camp to explore the country lying a short distance westerly from Brushy Canyon. After traveling perhaps two miles, he entered a little flat of comparatively smooth ground and was astonished to see the legs and feet of a man encased in breeches and boots projecting from a temporary shelter made by standing large slabs of pine bark endwise against the tree. After awakening the slumbering man and assuring him he meant no harm, Courier engaged in a lengthy conversation. Courier wanted to know if indeed are you Yankee Jim? Yes, I am Yankee Jim, replied the man. Courier inquired where Yankee Jim was born. Maine. Courier knew this was true as he himself was from Massachusetts and could recognize a Yankee accent. How did you arrive in California? I jumped ship, then wandered along the California coast. Then Yankee Jim made a strange request. He needed lead for an old gun. If Courier returned alone with the lead, Yankee Jim would show him his source of gold. Courier's impression of Yankee Jim was that he was a bad character, and a criminal, no doubt. Courier left and returned down the hill to his friends he had left at camp. Winter was setting in. Courier never returned. Of course, his presence became known to all of the men camped in the vicinity. But the storms began soon to occur very frequently and were of great severity, which caused the abandonment for the winter of the diggings upon Shirt Tail Canyon, the men returning to the river and other places. The following year, that part of the country was filled 
with people, extensive mines were discovered, and the new town started the rise and progress of which will be detailed hereafter. The new arrivals would discover Yankee Jim's horse corrals. Yankee Jim would need to make a hasty exit. After fleeing his namesake town of Yankee Jim's, and before reaching San Diego, there was only one uncorroborated notice concerning James Robinson. In the book, San Quentin, The Evolution of a State Prison, there is a reference of Robinson's arrest in San Joaquin County and being booked into the prison ship that was then San Quentin Prison. Neither California State Archives nor San Joaquin County had any record of Robinson's arrest. While James Robinson received little if any notice, there was another Yankee Jim who received both local and national attention. To complicate research, there were other desperados named Yankee Jim. March 1851, on the Yuba River, James Knowlton, better known to locals as Yankee Jim, was caught and faced Judge Lynch. Knowlton was a notorious rascal. Besides being a highwayman, he and his gang had been terrorizing the region, stealing horses, mules, and cattle. National news clippings of the capture and lynching of James Knowlton, whether exaggerated or honestly reported, showed the extent of fear the local miners had in this dangerous outlaw and his gang. The affair was not hurried over as though it were done in the excitement of the moment, but the culprit was kept in confinement for two days previous to his execution. And at one time, when it was rumored that his associates intended to rescue him, a force of 200 men, well armed, were organized to watch the prisoner. As reported in the news release, he did not confess to this specific crime, but stated that he had committed many other offenses worthy of death and had done some terrible things. Fifteen months prior to James Nolton, a.k.a. Yankee Jim, was lynched, an African-American, Louis Ford, age 30, was gunned down trying to escape a citizen's arrest, having been accused of being a horse thief. A charge of murder weighed against Mr. C. Morris. He was one of the men charged in Louis Ford's death. A court reporter took the testimony of those involved. There were no witnesses called to tell the deceased, Mr. Ford's, side of the story. Only testimony from whites were allowed in California courts. The report begins with the rustling of three horses from Mr. William P. Henry's business, a bathhouse. Henry and a friend, Samuel Taylor, decided to investigate for themselves who stole the horses. Attention centered, using the language of the period, on a Negro, Louis Ford. It appears that on Sunday, while Mr. Taylor was standing near the hay yard from which the horses had previously been stolen, the Negro came up with a saddle on his shoulder and commenced conversation. He dropped some expression which caused Taylor to take him for a horse thief, and the latter thereupon professed to be a horse thief. Also, and the Negro was soon convinced that they were both belonged to the same gang. The Negro referred to Peter Miller and Yankee Jim. The bathhouse owner, Mr. Henry, would secure more information from a man named Pike. Pike was a witness to mules being rustled across the American Fork. On Monday morning, Pike told Henry that he had seen the Negro Ford and learned from him that it was Yankee Jim who had stolen the horses and that they were driven to Marysville. It does not appear that from papers before us now how this Mr. Pike happened to be so well informed, but we judge from the tone of the depositions he was not one of the gang. 
It was learned that Ford was staying in a shanty and would be rustling more horses. Messieurs Henry, Taylor, and another man named Charles E. Morris would stake out the shanty and arrest him in the act. According to the testimony, Charles Morris grabbed Lewis Ford and bound his hands. Ford broke loose, running to escape. The men opened fire at the fleeing Ford. For obvious reasons, there was no testimony from the woman Ford was living with. The details found in the coroner's report was important in that it revealed that knowledge of the dangerous outlaw gang of Yankee Jim Knowlton extended south, down the Sacramento River to the confluence of the American River. Was there a connection between the miners on the American River and San Diego? 3,000 miles away in New Hampshire, a 20-year-old medical student had graduated from Dartmouth College. In today's jargon, he decides to take a gap year off. Upon hearing of the discovery of gold, George Parrish Tebbets sets sail for California. He will take the fastest route by hiking across Nicaragua's Panama Isthmus. Upon arrival on the Pacific side, Tebbets would catch a steamship heading north to San Francisco. It was a tradition for ships to make a port stop in San Diego. The ships were packed, every stateroom would be filled, as well as hundreds would be camping out on the deck. Upon arrival in San Diego, Tebbets must have been impressed with the potential for this small, unvarnished town. Arriving in the spring of 1849, he proceeded to the gold fields on the middle fork of the American River. There is no notation that Tebbets ever mined for gold on the North Fork or anywhere near Yankee Jim's. He enlisted the help of a Chinese boy. His helper might even have been older than Tebbets, as no age is given. To the recent Dartmouth graduate, the 49er gold rush must have shocked him. Miners worked hours in the summer heat. Washing river rock was back-breaking work. The mother load was a crude, alpha male-dominated society. Scoundrels from everywhere, vigilance committees, crime, lynching, banishment. Witnessing all these experiences must have left an indelible mark on his psyche. We do not know the exact date in late 1850 that Debitz left the North Fork. However, he was listed as one of the electors held in San Diego's first 1850 election and was elected councilman in 1851. Before leaving the gold fields, it would be highly speculative to suggest Tibbets had read about the death of Lewis Lord. From the details of the coroner's report, there was knowledge amongst the miners along the American River that there was a dangerous man named Yankee Jim and his gang who were terrorizing the gold fields of the northern Mother Lode along the Yuba River. Tibbets would have left the gold fields before James Knowlton was hanged. He probably did not know Yankee Jim's real name or a description of him. Tibbets would have even less or more than likely no knowledge of James Robinson, who was also known as Yankee Jim. Robinson was chased out of his namesake town in about January of 1852. This was at least nine months after Tibbets had left the South Fork for San Diego. All Tibbets knew was that there was a dangerous man named Yankee Jim. Riding south, Robinson joined up with two men, James Loring and William Harris. Destiny awaited, all just north of the border. There were two other men who made San Diego their home, and both had knowledge of the lawlessness of both San Francisco and the Mother Lode, Thomas Whaley and Louis Franklin. Sailing from New York City, Whaley arrived in San Francisco in July of 1849. His voyage around Cape Horn took 204 days. Whaley would spend two years in San Francisco selling dry goods. In 1851, his mercantile store burned to the ground. He suspected arson, 
perpetrated by an outlaw gang known as the Hounds. Lewis Franklin took a more circulative route, from his birthplace in Liverpool, England, to Jamaica to work with his brother, to Baltimore, and upon hearing of the gold rush, he left there for San Francisco. In San Francisco, Franklin set up a mercantile store in a tent. He and Whaley would become friends. When they heard that San Diego would be a great place for a mercantile store, Franklin folded his tent, and along with Whaley, they shipped off to San Diego. What specific stories they heard of horse rustling, lynching, or crime in the gold rush towns, I know not. The lynchings by the San Francisco Vigilance Committees they could not have missed. Both Franklin and Whaley would have stories to tell. In San Diego, Franklin would open a general store, serve as foreman of San Diego's first grand jury, and would be elected a county judge. Whaley would join Franklin in running a general store. However, it was the home Whaley built that he is remembered for today. But I'm getting ahead of my story. Tibbetts claimed he earned $70,000 gold mining on the North Fork of the American River. Upon departing the gold fields, he settled with his Chinese partner for $3,000, leaving him $67,000 to invest in San Diego. With a pouch full of gold to invest, Tibbetts could forecast a never-ending flow of thousands of male miners heading to and from the California Mother Lode, all stopping in San Diego. These visitors would need lodging, food, and entertainment. He acquired two investors, Philip Hoof and Lieutenant George H. Derby. Hoof will become an important link in our tale. The entrepreneurs would construct the first high-rise building in San Diego, the Exchange Hotel. They also operated a saloon and billiard hall. What could go wrong? San Diego 160 years ago would have no resemblance to San Diego you know today. In 1834, the missions had been disbanded by the new Mexican government. The land sold off. By 1850, the census report showed that the permanent population of San Diego County was only 798 individuals. This number did not include the tribal Indians, which would have added another 2,000 individuals to the population. The tens of thousands who passed through San Diego on the way to the Mother Lode, they had no interest in making San Diego their home. On the other hand, the Santa Fe Trail brought new settlers to Southern California. Discharged soldiers from the Mexican-American War would also find San Diego more to their liking. News between Northern California and Southern California was limited. San Diego's first newspaper would not have begun publishing until May 29th 1851. Beginning in 1850, groups called filibusterers or freebooters would also be heading south. Led by William Walker of Marysville, their goal was to further extend Anglo-Saxon American rule by starting new colonies south of the border. The lure of free land and adventure would lure miners from the northern mines of the Yuba River to the mines of the American River. Across from San Diego was Baja, California, ripe for taking. Were Robinson, Harris, and Loring freebooters? We will never know. Joshua Bean served with Zachary Taylor in the Mexican-American War. He settled in San Diego while the city was still under American occupation. Joshua was the older brother of his more noted younger brother, Roy Bean. Joshua Bean would serve as San Diego's first mayor under the United States flag. Like Joshua Bean, Tebbets became deeply involved in San Diego's politics. In 1851, he was elected as a councilman. Later, he would take his turn as San Diego's third mayor. San Diego was not immune to horse theft. In July of 1851, Tebbets became incensed as two of his horses were stolen while tied by his front porch. Three horse thieves were quickly apprehended. With ropes tied around their necks, 
the accused thieves were paraded around downtown San Diego, then promptly hanged. Tebbets noted that the word of the lynching reached Washington, who would send investigators to question how city officials permitted a lynching. When asked who was responsible, he replied to the investigators, the whole town. The matter ended there. I doubt if the investigators came from Washington. More than likely, they came from Sacramento. The United States had no anti-lynching law, but California did. A judgment of death must be executed within the walls or yard of a jail or some convenient private place in the county. The sheriff of the county must be present at the execution and must invite the presence of a physician, the district attorney of the county, and at least 12 reputable citizens to be selected by him, and he shall, at the request of the defendant, permit such ministers of the gospel not exceeding two, as the defendant may name and any person, relative or friend, not to exceed five, to be present at the execution. But no other persons than those mentioned in this section can be present at the execution. Augustin Hargathi was a long way from his home of Pest, Hungary. While he was of royal birth, he realized that he was poorer than many Hungarian peasants. To seek his fortune, he migrated to Wisconsin Territory. Having speculated in land development, he found himself overextended, and with the news of gold in California, he gathered his family and led a wagon train of migrants, taking the southern route ending in San Diego. As a leader of a successful wagon train, he received the honorary title of Colonel. Add his royal blood, made him a local San Diego hero. He was quickly elected sheriff with the added title of Marshal. San Diego County was strapped for cash. One of his first jobs as sheriff was to deliver a tax bill to the local Cupeño tribe for $600. Antonio Gara, chief, noted his tribe was short of cash. Could he pay half? The Attorney General, Thomas Sutherland, a former member of Haragathi's wagon train, told Haragathi the tribe needed to pay the entire tax bill. Or their cattle and land would be all confiscated. With no possible compromise, the local tribes rebelled. At the Warner's Ranch, the uprising resulted in the murder of five people. To put down the rebellion, a call for help brought federal troops, the Los Angeles militia, as well as a newly formed local San Diego militia who called themselves the Fitzgerald Volunteers. Josh Bean, who had left San Diego, would return leading the LA militia. In San Francisco, hearing of the uprising, 250 volunteers boarded a ship for San Diego. They called themselves the Hounds, naming themselves after the dangerous gang that infested San Francisco. They would arrive late after the rebellion had ended. Outnumbered 2,000 to 700, San Diego residents lived in fear. A 25-year-old merchant, Thomas Whaley, stood guard overnight. Sheriff Hargasi sent out a warrant for the arrest of Chief Antonio Gara. He would be caught and executed by firing squad. The firing squad would include prominent San Diego residents. William Marshall was called the wickedest man in California. According to Hubert Bancroft's research, in 1845 at age 17, Marshall stepped ashore in San Diego and deserted the whaling ship, the Hopewell. He also might have had a bunkmate joining him, Philip Crothswaite. Not wanting to be caught, Marshall traveled inland. In December of 1846, Marshall was accused of participating in an Indian uprising, but was found innocent. Now, just five years later, in the Gara uprising, he again was accused of participating in helping and instigating the death of five individuals at the Warner Rancho. He was found innocent of murder, but guilty of participating in the insurrection. 
the San Diego Militia Tribunal sentenced him to death by hanging. The rules of California civil court would not apply as this was a military court of law conducted by the militia. The jury was chosen from members of the San Diego militia. Sitting on the jury was Sheriff Haragasi and hotel owner Tebbets. Tebbets was also an officer in the militia. James W. Robinson served as the judge. Robinson was not related to James Robinson, a.k.a. Yankee Jim Robinson, from the Sierra Nevada. However, James W. Robinson would play an important role in Yankee Jim's trial the following year. Since James W. Robinson would play an important role in Yankee Jim's death, a little background is needed. James W. Robinson had abandoned his wife and children in Ohio. If he had simply divorced his wife, he would have had to take custody of his children. He fled to Arkansas and remarried. Next, we find him in Texas, which was not at this time part of the United States. This was the period of time of the Texan Rebellion from Mexico. For a short period of time, Robinson would serve as lieutenant governor, governor, and judge in the Texas government. He also took up arms fighting for Texan independence. In 1850, we find Robinson, his new wife, and son in San Diego practicing law. The jury found Marshall guilty of treason. The trial ended on December 12, 1851. There would be no 30-day wait. The next morning, along with another condemned man, the execution would take place in San Diego's plaza. At 2 p.m., there would be no secluded area for the execution. Local citizens gathered around the plaza to watch the execution. Father Holbein attended to the condemned man's final absolution. They were placed on the back of a wagon. Ropes and nooses were suspended from a cross beam. At the appropriate signal, the wagon moved away, leaving the men suspended five feet off the ground. Marsha was slowly strangled to death. After an hour, their bodies were cut down. The Hounds Militia, who had arrived late, now with nothing to do, began terrorizing San Diego. They were accused of theft horse wrestling, fighting, as well as clashes with local law. Sheriff Crossthwaite was shot in the leg trying to apprehend a hound. As soon as possible, they were ushered on the next ship, northbound. With crime on the rise, San Diego's city council realized that the town needed a new jail. Sheriff Augustin Hargathi, Hargathi's father, Charles Hargathi, who was a member of the city council, and the then mayor, Joshua Bean, put in a bid to build a new jail for $5,000. The structure was constructed of cobblestone and adobe. One of the first inmates of the jail was none other than the former mayor's younger brother, Roy. Roy had gotten into a duel wounding another man. While locked in the new jail, a lady admirer brought Roy a dinner of tamales. Within one of the tamales, was a pocket knife. Roy carved himself out, escaped on a waiting horse, destination Los Angeles, where he would join his brother Joshua. The new jail was useless. Using an inflation factor, the city would have owed today Josh Bean and Augustin Hargasti and his father $156,000. The city was bankrupt. The new jail was a total waste of money. Joshua Bean was in Los Angeles. Augustin Hargathi was elected to the California State Assembly. He left along with his father and family. The city was drowning in debt, unable to pay its bills. The state of California would take over conservatorship. Mayor Tebbett's term as mayor lasted just two weeks. San Diego was in total meltdown. The San Diego Herald called for a renewed effort to bring law and order to their community. Not knowing the state of affairs in San Diego, Yankee Jim, James Loring, and William Harris rode into town. We will never know why Robinson and his two friends rode south into San Diego. 
Maybe Robinson, Harris, and Loring might have been planning to join up with the freebooters, trying to establish new colonies south of the border. Or maybe in Robinson's early sailing days, he had paid a port call on the sleepy Mexican town. However, in early August 1852, this was not the San Diego he once knew. According to the news account of the period, the three men sold their horses, bought provisions, and visited the local gambling establishments. Since there were no record of Robinson, Harris, or Loring as being wanted, they were warned that they were welcome to stay as long as they did not create any trouble. Hey, new in town? Got a name? From up north. Got some gossip from up north? In the 1850s, newspaper articles concerning desperados were covered differently. Unlike today, where we want total identification, a mugshot, height, weight, color of hair, national heritage, if you could, toss in his blood type and DNA. In this newspaper clipping of Yankee Jim, James Knowlton, the reader is told the basic facts, that Knowlton was rustling horses and mules as well as forging ownership documents. He was part of a large gang and was a very dangerous hombre. If Knowlton walked into a bar, no one would be able to identify him which begs the question of how did the community associate James Robinson with being a horse thief escaping from the northern mother load. All it would have taken was a slip of the tongue by Harris, Loring, or even James Robinson himself that in the gold fields up north he was known as Yankee Jim. Since Tebbets owned a gambling hall, he would have been most interested in who the six-foot-tall guy was and would have forwarded the information to the sheriff. In a small town, news would have spread rapidly that a most dangerous outlaw, Yankee Jim, was loose in their town. It was the night of August 13, 1852, on this night, a full moon lit San Diego's harbor. Uh, no. It was a very dark night, with only starlight to illuminate San Diego's harbor. An important point not brought out in the abbreviated trial of James Robinson. The 30-ton schooner Plutus lay at anchor. There was an alarm that there was a man rowing a boat suspiciously near the Plutus. Keating, a part owner of the rowboat, said he hailed the boat. He discerned the color of the man's shirt in the rowboat was red. On a dark night, was this possible? Again, not brought out in the trial. Deputy Sheriff Reiner was called to investigate. John C. Stewart and Enos Wall, two names to be remembered, were also owners of the rowboat. As they looked suspicious, Loring and Harris were arrested. Word spread throughout town to look for a man in a red shirt. At a local ranch, James Robinson, hungry, asked for food. Recognized as the wanted man in a red shirt, Robinson tried to escape. He was lassoed and tied up. A bash to his head with a shovel ended any struggle. Robinson would be brought into town where a hasty trial would take place. At this point, we need to ask a few questions. Why did a joyride on a rowboat create a cyclone response? A few stripes on the accused backs and expulsion from San Diego would have been a just verdict. To be sure, James Robinson, Yankee Jim, would need a lawyer. Lawyers who were available had varied qualifications. A carpenter, a teamster, a storekeeper, a minister, or a doctor. Yankee Jim chose to defend himself. The trial judge would be San Diego's first elected county judge, John Hayes. Hayes migrated from Texas, where in Texas he was an actor. Harris and Loring were separated from James Robinson. The two men were then interrogated by a quickly arranged grand jury. We do not know what went on behind the closed doors. We do not know why Harris and Loring confessed to rustling horses in the Central Valley or why and how they, untrained sailors, planned to pirate the 30-ton schooner and sail south. Remember, Harris was a tailor. Loring was a laborer. Both Harris and Loring 
were from non-seafaring regions of the United States. Was their confession honestly given, or was it a quid pro quo to save their own lives? Loring and Harris would receive sentences of just two years to be served on the San Quentin prison ship. The jury quickly received Loring and Harris's confessions. However, what sealed James Robinson's fate came for what the San Diego Herald newspaper called a rumor spread by a reliable character. The statement would taint both the public, but more importantly, taint the jury. Soon after their arrival came information of a reliable character, which pointed out Yankee Jim as a dangerous character. It was said that he had loafed around various mining camps, and watching his opportunity had pounced upon miners in and out of the way places, murdered them and robbed them of their gold and trinkets. As long as he behaved himself, he was not molested here. Yankee Jim was a Canadian Frenchman six feet and three or four inches in height and well-developed physically. He had anything but a prepossessing appearance and was shunned by all respectable people. Notice in the article that the article claims that Yankee Jim was a Canadian of French origin. The article continued. The reliable source furnished information to the court that Yankee Jim was a dangerous man, known to have murdered and robbed miners in out-of-the-way camps, in other parts of the state robbed wagon trains and killed a few of his partners in Arizona. To conclude a good mystery, Agatha Christie would ask Perot to summarize and point his finger on the culprit, or in this case, culprits. Let's start with James W. Robinson, the prosecuting attorney. He and Hargasti had invested in numerous San Diego land parcels. If a notorious northern crime gang invaded and took over San Diego and crime continued to escalate, their investments would be worthless. When asked by the grand jury on how to rid San Diego of Yankee Jim, he would have been the one with the knowledge to add the value of the schooner to the rowboat, making the crime a felony. Lewis Franklin also had a lot to lose if crime was not abated. He owned a general store and was looking to buy the Exchange Hotel from Tebbets. Franklin not only served on San Diego's grand jury, but also wrote the report on the dire financial straits the city was in. He was in San Francisco during the period when James Knowlton's gang terrorized the Yuba River. His San Francisco general store would have heard gossip of a vicious gang led by Yankee Jim. He left San Francisco before Knowlton was hanged. Judge John Hayes was also involved in grand plans for San Diego, even before San Diego was transferred to the United States Plans envisioned a rail line connecting San Diego with Yuma. The final charter would be finalized in 1854. Judge John Hayes, James W. Robinson, Louis Rose, and George P. Tebbets were all in on the planning stage. Crime had to be brought under control. At this point, Perot would point to George Tebbets. Tebbets was the only known person who had been placer mining on the middle fork of the American River. Tebbets would have heard talk of a dangerous gang led by Yankee Jim. Tebbets would not have known Knowlton's name nor a description of the man known as Yankee Jim. Only that there was a dangerous gang led by Yankee Jim on the Yuba River and his thievery and gang reached down into the American River. Tebbets left the North Fork before Knowlton was hanged. Neither Los Angeles or San Diego had a newspaper to report the details of Knowlton's death. Like prosecutor James W. Robinson, Tebbets' investments in his hotel and gambling and billiard establishments were at stake. There was one more avenue where Tebbets could have spread misleading gossip about Yankee Jim, thus tainting the jury. 
On June 19, 1851, the first meeting of the new Masonic Lodge No. 33 met at Augustin Hargathi's home. In our tale, some of the Lodge brothers' names are familiar. George Tebbets, Philip Crothwaite, James W. Robinson, Augustin Hargathi, Philip Hoots, and a visiting brother, Louis Rose. Louis Rose and Judge Louis Franklin were well acquainted with each other through both faith as well as both being members of the San Diego Grand Jury. While Franklin was not a Masonic member, Judge Franklin could have spun tales of the lawlessness in the mother lode to Louis Rose. With Yankee Jim in town, Franklin's tales could have been repeated to Rose's Lodge brothers. Masonic Lodge brother, as well as a member of the jury, Philip Hoots, could have carried Tebbets and other Lodge brothers' tales of Yankee Jim directly into the jury room. It took only 30 minutes to convict Robinson. In a community of only 700 individuals, gossip must have also predisposed the jury to a belief that a hated French-Canadian murderer must face justice. Two Indian Uprisings Horse thieves, murderers, bands of the San Francisco gang called the Hounds, all had terrorized San Diego. The last indignity was the city was bankrupt, its charter revoked by the state. There was a need to send a clear warning to criminals, stay out of San Diego. There were also financial reasons at stake. Profits and land speculation depended upon a reduction in crime. Judge Hayes, by the letter of the California State Anti-Lynching Law, set the date and the time of the hanging to exactly 30 days to the minute from the time of his sentencing. On September 28, 1851, Crothswaite held his pocket watch in his hand. While James Robinson was giving his last words to the assembled citizens of San Diego, in mid-sentence, Closely watching his pocket watch, Crossway gave the nod and once again a wagon moved forward. James Robinson tried to tiptoe for a moment before falling, gasping, strangling to a long and gruesome death. Merchant Thomas Whaley watched the hanging. He would purchase the very spot where Yankee Jim Robinson struggled for his last breath. Upon that very spot, he would buy the plot of land and build a brick structure of his own design. The building would eventually become his family home. Someone put a marker on the burial plot of James Robinson. The name misidentified the gravesite as that of James W. Robinson. James W. was the prosecuting attorney. I'm sure Yankee Jim's spirit found this unacceptable, and so his spirit now resides in the Whaley House, the most haunted house in America. I want to extend a special thank you to George Brewster. His article, Tumultuous Terms, the Two-Bit Mayor, sent me back to re-examining the life and times of James Robinson. His gracious help was appreciated. For more information on how you can protect our American River watershed, please visit us on Facebook, The Dry Creek Conservancy. For a complete list of videos on our Northern California watersheds, please visit my website, www.youtube.com slash C slash Michael Stark 1.